Since, uh, I guess, 2012, 2013, I have been very privileged to be part of the City of Vancouver's Civic Asset Naming uh, Committee, which is a group of folks with representatives from the Historical Society and uh, the Places uh, folks and Urban Aboriginal Advisory Committee and a wide range of folks. And we get to make decisions about naming stuff. And uh, it is one of the most, I think, interesting and fulfilling things um, that I volunteer for because the discussions are so robust and so interesting. And the amount of research that everyone on the committee does is quite extraordinary. And so when I was asked to present something, I thought, well, let's talk about naming because uh, you know, it, it impacts us to a certain degree every day because if and when we're out and about, um, you use street names to get places. You use names at, uh, you know, SkyTrain stations and various things. And often we don't think of the meaning of the name, but I think it's always interesting to know the background to names and, and various things like that. And so tonight what we're going to do Let's talk a little bit about just sort of the little bit of history of naming in the city in terms of how the city developed and how that's impacted some of the names and, and things like that. Um, and then run through some more recent names that have been added to the landscape and the thought processes that go behind that. Um, because I think one of the th things that I find so interesting is, you know, you can pull a name out of the hat, but you really want a name to land on the place where it's supposed to be and have meaning and have context. And so that's what we strive to do with the names that we're trying to create. But I did want to go back and acknowledge the land that we do occupy um, because there was names and places and meaning before we got here. And unfortunately, a lot of that was just wiped off the face of the earth just by the sheer force of, of Sunt. Uh, Major Matthews, the city's first archivist, did take the time to talk mostly to Squamish uh, men about place names, and he did record um, them in a series of maps. This one is the one that I find so fascinating because it mixes up his iconography and all manner of different things, and the title is a bit much, but um, he does capture a lot of names, but Matthews was Vancouver centric. And so the city boundary was at 16th Avenue until 1929. And if you look at Matthews maps and his other maps, he rarely, certainly when he's gathering First Nations names, rarely goes below 16th Avenue. And in his collected notes about Vancouver, I did a word search on the online one to find Musqueam. And there's like maybe two instances. And my favorite is uh, showed Musqueam men map of names. He said all wrong, but there's no follow up. And so we have no sort of feedback from the Musqueam down on the Fraser River. But nevertheless, this actually is an important record because it was one of the few earliest of capturing names and has led to a lot of the research by the three nations into the naming structure and recalling and, and bringing those names back. And part of that is showing up here with Musqueam. They have a fabulous interactive map where you can um, call up place names in the water and the land and stories. And when you click on one of the um, squares or circles on the map, it brings up the name it brings up the story and it brings up whatever associated history there is. And the thing that I really like about this is that you can also have, click on the audio file and it will tell you what it, how the word sounds. And so it's really great trying to wrap your name around, you know, some of the pronunciation, which I think to someone like myself, I struggle with French even. So, you know, struggling with some of the other languages, but having that audio file is, is quite nice. Um, the Squamish also have a really, really great map. And they, of course, with Squamish territory, much 
larger, and so it's it encompasses much more. But again, it's interactive as well, and it's it's again a really great resource. And so there are these um, tools out there for understanding the land that we're actually on. But once settlement starts, of course, we start to parcel things out. And so one of the things that's interesting is just how Vancouver develops. And so here we have an 1870 uh, map, which is the district lots. And district lots are the very first marks on the land at, to begin the process of basically selling it. And so district lots are the first mark. And this, the 1870 map, you can already see what we think of as Vancouver, is already got a whole bunch of different parcels carved out of it. Much of this was done by preemption. You essentially walked out in the forest, put a couple of stakes in the ground, wrote to the government and gave them the rough location. And if you occupied it for a set number of years and agreed to make improvements to it and didn't go off on vacation for a year or so, you ended up with uh, paying a fee and ended up with title to it. And so much of that early parcels were actually grabbed by politicians in Victoria and others, but it has an impact on the city and our perception of the city. So the two reserves that were here in the early city, Musqueam down on the Fraser River, and of course, Sanok, which um, basically lasted until the, the teens, and it was officially uh, taken away in the 1940s. But, you know, the popula native population was stuffed into those two. And then the Hastings town site was where Vancouver, or Hastings, I guess, should have been, uh, except nothing happened over there because the sawmill moved uh, further west. And so the Hastings mill, or sorry, the Hastings town site sat there by itself. The provincial government got into the land game and one of their uh, timber reserves, they felt that they could carve that up into parcels and sell it and make a profit. And they were actually trying to put that at auction before the city of Vancouver was incorporated. So not surprisingly, not a heck of a lot happened with it, but they then continued to try and sell it periodically and then had one big auction in about 1906, which seemed to clear off much of the land. But as we'll see later, that ownership of that parcel has given us uh, some names on the landscape, uh, which we inherited from them and one in particular that can be quite troublesome. Uh, City of Vancouver goes to 16th Avenue and roughly to Elma. And so that's where a lot of the activity takes place in terms of development and, and streets and various things like that. And when you shift the district lot map to the 1970s, and this is the 1974 district lot map, what's really interesting is to see how on the west side, very little has changed in terms of parcels. Whereas on the east side, you have what was open land now subdivided up into tiny little parcels. And so that actually gives that east-west divide. Um, it's not and wasn't early on an economic divide. It was really a perceptional divide. Uh, South Vancouver was created in 1892. And so it stretched all the way across the city uh, the lower half of it out to the university boundary. But in 1908, of course, the folk west side got tired of the quote farmers on the east side. And so they split. And so Canby Street became the boundary between, between the new municipality of Point Grey and of course, South Vancouver. And you can see just by that simple divide, how perception would see the east side as something a little bit crazy and the west side, very, very different, because you have very large parcels of property that haven't really been subdivided up into smaller pieces. And when you add in the ownership, of course, the Canadian Pacific Railway, that 6,000 acres on the southern shore of Falls Creek and 500 and some odd acres downtown. And the bulk of that sits within Point Grey. And so when it came time to sell that and subdivide it, a lot of the naming structure came from Canadian Pacific Railway itself 
and of course there's surveyor uh, Lachlan Hamilton. And on the east side, South Vancouver, all those tiny little parcels meant that you got half streets, sometimes no lanes, a street might go for the equivalent of two blocks or something and then stop. And it was also individuals that owned their little pieces. And so the naming structure was very ad hoc and all sorts of names uh, showed up and then disappeared. And that's one of the interesting things about sort of the east side, how often street names would change. And then of course, back in the city of Vancouver, the Vancouver Improvement Company and its directors and uh, shareholders, they controlled not only the improvement company's lands out to Nanaimo, but they also, through many of their directors and things, controlled uh, what we think of as Grandview Woodlands and then a big chunk of Mount Pleasant as well. And so there, one person, Dr. Israel Powell, for instance, had a big influence on the naming in Mount Pleasant and throughout the Strathcona neighborhood, most of the streets were named after directors for the improvement company. And so land ownership and subdivision come into play a lot. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, Justin McElroy from the CBC because he took on in 2019, uh, one of his crazy projects and he just decided to take every street in the city, categorize it, break it down into what were the representations of, you know, was it trees, was it people, was it uh, women, etc. And so by doing all of that, he did produce something that was quite interesting, just a nice little part. And it shows the five categories essentially that the bulk of the names can be dropped into. And so we have men, of course, taking the top spot just because they were the ones that seemed to control things. Surprisingly, trees are very popular. Then it's golf courses, then it's war battles, and then it's women. And so you can see the inequity in the main structure just in terms of very few women's name. I think they make up about 2% of the total streets in the lower mainland. And of course, men are the, the bulk of it. The interesting stat that I found was that 62 names we don't know the origins of the name. It's been lost over time or over in history. So it's just a nice little diversion. If you go to the CBC website, you can find it by tapping in street names and Justin's name. Um, and it's a, a lot of fun. And he did use Elizabeth Walker's book, which the Historical Society produced um, to delve into a lot of the minutia of the names. Um, but it's just a nice uh, diversion. Um, and you'll learn some stuff. But naming is also so interesting to me about how we perceive how things were named. So here we are in Gastown. Here we are with members of the Vancouver Pioneer Association. And uh, we're looking at the drinking fountain that used to occupy Maple Tree Square. And the plaque that's on the drinking fountain is now pasted to the base of uh, Gassy Jack's statue. And so it reads in part that here stood the old maple tree under whose branches the pioneers met in 1885 and chose the name Vancouver for this city. Well, of course, that's hooey. Um, they had no such uh, role in the naming of the city uh, because that was left to Cornelius Van Horn, who was the general manager of the Canadian Pacific Railway. And so Again, the 1930s were a really great period of kind of rewriting history in many different jurisdictions. And we've seen some of the issues that that has brought up in uh, contemporary society. Um, and just that sort of, I guess, gaze to the past and uh, you know, forgetting or reimagining your history. But anyway, Van Horn though, did name the city and Nominally, we're named after Vancouver, uh, the sea captain that mapped the coast and actually gave many of the names to the coast that we still have today. Uh, this is him in King's Lynn, uh, odd little statue there. Uh, this is his, our version of him uh, based on a painting that might be of him uh, at City Hall. And of course, there was great fanfare in 1936, the uh, 
uh, Jubilee of the City, our 50th birthday. And so uh, we paid to have a statue of uh, Vancouver that we were named after. And uh, it was erected at City Hall with great fanfare. But they kind of forgot he was named after an island or our city was named after an island. And if you go back to one of the very, very old charts, you can actually see uh, that Vancouver Island was Quadra and Vancouver's island. Uh, the two navigators quite liked each other. And when um, Britain took the north and Spain took the south, they met out in the Strait of Georgia and they rafted the two ships together and they had a great long dinner. And to commemorate their friendship, they uh, named the island after themselves. Well, of course, over time, the quadra got dropped, the possessive Vancouver's got dropped, uh, and it just became Vancouver Island. And as a crown colony, it was well known uh, just because it was part of the British Empire. And that was Van Horn's rationale. And what he said was that it's very important that the terminal city should have a name dignified as well as euphonious. And it should, if possible, be made to suggest its location. And Vancouver, heard in any part of the world, is at once appropriately or approximately located. And so he chose the name of the island for the city, which was then named after George Vancouver. And so that's how we got our name. What's interesting too is the Postmaster General of Canada hated this. And there's some lovely correspondence in the National Archives between Van Horn and the Postmaster General, who's trying to get Van Horn to change the name of his new city because of the confusion that it would cause to the Postal Service, but obviously Van Horn won. So when we take that same map though, what's interesting is if we start looking at all the inlets, and this is a, a map that uh, they hadn't figured out yet, that Vancouver um, exists in the Fraser River and all those things. So where you see Burrard's Canal, that's essentially um, Burrard Inlet. And then Vancouver is that big sort of blob between Birch Bay and Burrard's Canal. But you can see all the different inlets and canals and they're all possessive. You've got Jarvis's Inlet, and Butte's Canal, um, Howe's Sound. And so it's interesting there because Vancouver named these in the 1700s, but sitting in the uh, map office uh, was Lachlan Hamilton, who was the Canadian Pacific Railway surveyor, who is credited with basically drawing much of the street infrastructure for Vancouver. And what did he do? He had a nautical chart uh, up in his office, and he drew from the chart for many of the names in the West End. And so you got Butte Street, named after Butte Inlet, which was named for the Earl of Butte. Uh, Jervis Street, spelt here with the E for Jarvis Inlet, and it was Rear Admiral John Jarvis. The map is interesting because Jarvis is spelt with an A. So I'm not sure who made the error there. Howe Sound um, is Howe Street, and that's Earl of Howe, the First Lord of the Admiralty. And Thurlow Street is the Thurlow Islands, and uh, the Lord Chancellor, Edward Thurlow. And so, What's interesting is spelling mistakes did make it into the street names. And there are a couple of uh, spelling errors on charts that Hamilton used, which then we've made permanent on some of our streets. And so when you're looking at the West End, you have the geography laid out by Vancouver influencing uh, the street names. Um, and then trees, uh, you have, um, the Fairview Slopes area. And uh, you have, of course, uh, Lachlan Hamilton here. This is a photograph of him from the newspaper. He had retired to Florida and uh, the Vancouver Pioneers Association kept bugging him for a comment about the early city and things. And he was in the newspaper about how he came to name a bunch of the different streets and things. And so on the Fairview Slopes, um, it was trees. And so it's bracketed by Willow and U Street um, because I don't think he intended vine to be a tree and certainly Heather is ground cover, not, not trees. But he did lay out a program for streets. And according to Major Matthews, uh, they were supposed to be named after Canadian trees 
and in alphabetical order. But it's claimed that the draftsman messed it up. So we have a jumble of, of tree names on the Fairview Slopes. What is interesting about the Fairview Slopes too is that was actually intended by the Canadian Pacific Railway as their sort of early premier neighborhood because it was on a slope, you got some great views and uh, things, but what they didn't count on was the industrialization of False Creek. And so by the early 1900s, they basically had an auction sale and they got rid of everything from about 15th Avenue all the way down to False Creek and over to, I believe it was Cypress Street. They just kind of disposed of it all, got rid of it. And then that way they could concentrate on their property, which in fact, uh, didn't have sawmill smoke and uh, smells and other things, the noise from the yards, but still the, the tree names uh, survive. And then it's family and friends too. And I think, uh, you know, District Lot 301, uh, that was actually separate from the city for a number of years. It's an odd parcel because a good chunk of it was surveyed across a giant bog that stretches roughly from Fraser Street to just a couple of streets before Main Street. And if you've ever driven, uh, say, down 16th Avenue after Main, you go down the hill, and then uh, it starts to get a bit bumpy. And if you take a right-hand turn and go down, say, 15th Avenue, you're in for a real surprise because, of course, the streets have sunk, the houses are sinking um, because it's a bog. And so it wasn't very popular. But it was uh, Henry Valentine Edmonds who owned it. This is him here. And he owned masses of property around uh, the lower mainland. But in this parcel, he just decided that it would, um, the streets that he had uh, were going to be named after his kids, his wife, the sisters and relatives and things like that. And we're looking at the district um, map itself. It's so interesting to see you know, there's Walter Street and there's, you know, Edward Street, etc. cetera. And, um, just all the kids and all the family names. And so you had names like Jane and Walter and John and Sophie and Beachy. And out of all of this, um, Sophie, now spelt with a I-E, uh, is the one street, or I-A, I guess, Sophie, but it's still pronounced Sophie. Um, that street survives. And there is a John Street, but it's not named for one of um, Mr. Edmund's relatives. It's a different uh, John. And then, of course, all of those names have disappeared uh, as we regularized uh, street names. And certainly when this joined the city of Vancouver about 1912, uh, then you would take the streets. And as they connected to other streets, you would take the name uh, from one or the other and then run it through. And the bylaw books are filled with bylaw amendments for street names where they've joined up three separate streets, three separate names, and then it just becomes one uh, name. And of course, provinces. And so this is uh, Dr. Israel Powell. He was a part owner along with Edmonds in District Lot 200A. And uh, so that runs basically from uh, the edge of Falls Creek all the way up to Broadway, today's Broadway, and uh, Prince Edward on one side and Yukon Street on the other. And so he decided to name everything after um, the provinces that uh, made up Canada in 1888. And so that was seven of those. And so it was on one side, Prince Edward, and then it was Brunswick, and uh, then it was Quebec and Ontario and Manitoba, etc. And when we get to the far side of the map, you can see there are two streets with no names. And when El yeah, Alberta and the Yukon uh, joined the Confederation, uh, then those got names. And so that's Alberta and Yukon being added there. And Saskatchewan lost out because there wasn't room for Saskatchewan when it finally did join Canada. And Marpole had a huge uh, prairie population and uh, so many of the streets down there were named after prayer, uh, Saskatchewan towns and uh, various things. And there was actually a Saskatchewan street as well. And the redevelopment of the Safeways uh, parking lot uh, and whole 
store and everything else uh, at 70th and Grenville, one of the interesting things is there's a city right of way that uh, was required that the developer hand over. And uh, so the Civic Assets Naming Committee uh, back then when it was first constituted in 2012, uh, Elizabeth Walker served on the committee and she recalled that there used to be a Saskatchewan street in uh, Marple and she thought it would be a good thing to bring it back. And so they brought it back as the through road through uh, the Safeways uh, parking lot. And so a little bit of history comes back onto the street. And the one thing that is interesting is that um, it's been said that uh, Powell uh, just did that Ontario street uh, would be uh, the center street where the street numbering starts. And uh, that's because Ontario is somehow central Canada. And so that makes sense. Uh, but the zeros, that's actually because of Carroll Street, because Carroll was the first street that was surveyed. And the Hastings Sawmill owned everything to the east of Carroll. And so the town site was to the west. And so when you started numbering one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, um, that was fine until the Oppenheimers and others bought the uh, timber mills property. And as they started to add things, then it was one, two, three, four, and it became west and east. And the timber lease that the Hastings Mill had, conveniently, they just drew a line straight across the creek. So Carroll Street ends up lining up with Ontario, and hence the zero point for addresses runs right through uh, the city. And so that's Ontario Street. And then we have the battle streets. And, you know, I thought with doing any reading on that, that, uh, you know, someone must have come up with it just in terms of a property owner or something like that. But there was um, the battle streets, Trafalgar, Balaclava, Blenheim, Waterloo, and Elma. And uh, they were brought to the attention of an alderman by Miss Dora Bulwer. And uh, she was the niece of um, Henry Bulwer, uh, who was up in the Hatsik and various other places and quite a mover and shaker. And anyway, she was having tea, I guess, with Mr. Callan. And um, he was an alderman at the time. And there was some confusion about street names uh, because we ended up, there were two Cornwalls, for instance, there were um, other streets, Campbell, for instance, used to be Elma. There was Campbell over in the uh, east side in Strathcona. So they were looking to replace those names. And I guess over tea, uh, Doris suggested great battles, British battles. And so that's what they did. And uh, I love the comment in the newspaper. Um, Callan was interviewed uh, many years later in the 1930s. And uh, he had said that, yes, they'd had tea and they came up with the names. And then he said, I chose the best name, Trafalgar, for my street. And um, then he went to council and said, basically, let's rename these streets after these battles. And he'd already placed them on the landscape. So Trafalgar was his. And he lived at Point Grey Road and the newly named Trafalgar. And Trafalgar was the boundary point between the Canadian Pacific Railways property um, as what, to uh, what becomes uh, the municipality of Point Grey. And so there is another boundary line in there. And our provincial government, uh, this is the auction map. Uh, the J.P. Davies Company was tasked with selling this in the 1900s. I think this is the 1906 map. And the blue lots are the ones that have been sold. And so they had made some progress on this. Um, but again, it, it took some time. But one of the things that we did inherit um, from the province were a bunch of names. So initially, all of the north-south streets were named in part for politicians, and we count the governor generals in that. So Lansdowne Street, which runs through as the major street, it was surveyed with a ceremonial width, and it runs through the two public parks, A and B there. And that was the center of this uh, subdivision. He was the Governor General of Canada, uh, Cornwall, 
he was uh, the provincial lieutenant governor, C.F. Cornwall. And Cornwall Street over um, in Kitsilano is actually named after the Duke and Duchess of York and Cornwall went on their big uh, visit back in the early 1900s. And so to commemorate the visit, they renamed First and Second Avenue. So first became Cornwall and second became York. Um, Richards, that's A.N. Richards, another Lieutenant Governor. And Richard Street is right on the edge of our map here. And uh, those names have all disappeared, partly through duplication, because uh, Lansdowne was actually over in Mount Pleasant at one point, joining some other Lieutenant Governors. And uh, other names, Richards, of course, was duplicated downtown, etc. cetera. Uh, however, the one name we are left with is, of course, Mr. Trutch. And uh, we'll talk about him near the end, uh, but the city didn't name the street after him. The government, provincial government named the street after him. And uh, Mr. Trutch sits out there on the street. And interestingly too, the public park ended up be called, being called McBride Park. And so the two folks that had uh, caused great grief to the indigenous population in British Columbia um, sit on this uh, former provincial piece of land. And so naming stuff, so how do we do it? And so I think it's useful to understand sort of the mechanism in which how currently things are named. And so prior to 2012, names were recommended by, you know, to council by city staff. There was an internal committee that basically met whenever they needed a street. Um, street names are really required because of development. So if you have a parcel of land and somebody wants to develop it, well, you need an address. And if you don't have an address, um, how do you get one? Well, you have to create one. Well, you need a street. And so you need to name it. And so staff would do that. And a lot of times, you know, it was fairly good. Um, and I think the creativity shown um, throughout the False Creek, the South False Creek area, from Granville Island over to the, uh, towards the Canby Street Bridge, you know, there's a lot of really interesting local history there. Somebody read a book about uh, early Vancouver and the lake that was found on the beach, um, which turned out to be a guy that was in the forest, got eaten by a bear, um, things like that. And so there is, you know, sawmill names and things. So there was some creativity there. Other times, though, you cringe at some of the decisions that were made. And that's partly why City Council decided to create the Civic Assets Naming Committee was to bring a more diverse, uh, I think, opinions and ideas into the naming and then have that uh, be recommended to council. And so we're a rare advisory committee because uh, the committee gets to um, come up with the names and then write the council report that goes to council that basically says, this is what we want and council 99 times out of 100 uh, says yes. And so then the bylaws are written and, and stuff goes like that. Many other advisory committees can write to council and say, we would like you to think about this, but I don't believe there's another uh, council committee that actually writes a council report. And uh, so that's important. And uh, we, advise council on the naming of city owned assets. And so that's key because we don't touch school board or parks board property. Uh, we are one of the very few cities in North America that have an independent, uh, financially independent and elected park board. So they own their own property and make their own decisions and the school board, the same thing. And as I mentioned, I think off the top of that, um, we have members of the public, and so people apply like any other so, um, as a, um, advisory committee. There we go. Uh, but we do have um, public space uh, network uh, representative. We've got one from the Vancouver Historical Society, and uh, we've got a couple of other groups. And then we also have members from different advisory groups. And so uh, the Urban Aboriginal Advisory um, have members that sit uh, with our committee as well. And uh, so that's sort of the, the framework for things. And it's a mandate given 
by council. So we have to work within that. So you may have heard about the reserve list and um, it's still called the reserve list, but the committee a number of years ago looked at the list and kind of went, um, I think a lot of these names are never going to be used. And uh, so, you know, with the committee, we went through the list and took out just names that weren't going to work. Uh, there were a couple of people that were still alive. You're not, to have, not allowed to have a name uh, on a street if you're still kicking. And so those names disappeared. And we then reorganized it into three separate pieces. And the key one is the reserved list. And this is names that actually have a place that we want to put them. And so just from the first page here, you've got Jeanette Anderson. And uh, so we give a brief background and then where it's gonna go. And then, um, you know, in, in this case, we can't use Anderson because of Anderson Street on Granville Island, but we can use Jeanette, so Jeanette Street. And so we've got a recommendation uh, for where it will go. Same thing with Bull Rush and all the others in the reserved section. Um, this is sort of the list that will eventually be forwarded to council when the opportunity comes up. So, you know, Jeanette will go in a council report for the Pearson Dogwood site eventually. Bull Rush is making its way through um, and things. And so that's the list that really gives you a sense of what's going to happen in the near future. The reference list is a list to capture names that are submitted by the public. And as long as they're not outrageous or silly, um, you know, Streety McStreet Street uh, will never make it onto the reference list. Uh, but we do have Nikola Tesla because it was submitted by uh, the Serbian Consul General. And so this is a place to capture those names suggested. And sometimes there's research done on them. Other times they need research. And so the committee then really places um, names that they'd like to see somewhere or use or give some thought to on the reference list. And when they're placed on, there is a sense of, can we, do we want to place it anywhere? And many times, as you'll see with Sam Bass or um, others, no, nope, it's name it for anything and place it anywhere. Whereas we have other names that are very specific. So, uh, you know, George Ackrick, for instance, um, it's, it's somewhere in Point Grey. And so the reference list then captures all of those names that come to us. And it just allows us to keep things. I don't think we'll ever name um, anything after Mr. Tesla, but we're not going to turn that suggestion down. And so we're going to keep it on the reference list. And so that's the purpose of that list. And then our last list is very key, is the recognized list. And we do that because, you know, there are names that are suggested to us that might be really great names, but, you know, you might take a look at the commemoration that, that person or thing already has, and you kind of go, you know what? No got the tower block or the statue or the whatever's um, named after them, but we put them on the recognized list anyway. So then it's captured. But at the same time, as things from the reserved list get named, so Rosemary Brown, for instance, is now on our recognized list. Um, she has a tiny little park named for her over in the brewery district just off Arbutus, but we also named a, a West End Lane for her, so she's moved into that section. So it then keeps a list of all the things that have been used and where they're used and what they are. And so this is how, you know, the reference list, um, or sorry, no, the, re the reserve list works. Um, and it's a, now, I think, a, a fairly useful tool that the committee um, uses. And so, public can actually request a name to be added to the lists. And uh, the web address is here. Um, but if you just did a Google search for Civic Assets Naming uh, Committee, you'll come up with our website and the links. And it's a simple form to fill out. But And we give you the criteria of what's good and what's not. And basically, if you're alive, you can't have a street named after you. 
Um, and also recognition. If it's already recognized in many ways, then generally it probably won't be accepted. Um, so, you know, there are some parameters, but it's an easy uh, thing to suggest uh, to the committee. So I wanted to look at some names and how we've done and what we've done. And I got to say, out of all of the names that we've had over the years, my favorite still has to be, I think, this one, Pullman Porter Street. Um, you know, most of the time we get to ponder uh, a name for a while and, you know, we don't uh, come up with names very quickly. We take a heck of a lot of time to think about them and uh, just really think about them. But one of my very early meetings uh, the city surveyor showed up and said, I need a street name and I need it tonight. And we're like, uh, really? And uh, Al Zacharias, who was the surveyor of the day, said, yep, we need a street. And so we got the information and then a couple of us sat at the back of the room while the rest of the meeting went on and hacked away at creating a name. And so it's an interesting process because I'm going to leave the 1912 fire insurance map up because I find it so fascinating too how much the city changes just by sheer development and landfill and everything else. So here's the street network laid on top of the 1912 fire insurance map. And you see a lot of water is now land. And I left the water line up there um, to show science world and things. And so with all this network of streets, uh, the one street that needed to be named uh, is here, and it runs between Switchman and uh, what was Front Street, which is now uh, First Avenue. Now, Switchman is interesting, too, because it was named by the staff committee, and it was in response to the planning idea that the area from Terminal uh, pretty much to First Avenue and uh, both sides of Main Street all the way back to Station Street were kind of the railway district. And that's because the streets like Central, Southern, Northern, um, they're all named as railways, you know, the Central Railway, the Northern Railway, etc. And they were done when the creek was filled back in uh, 1919. So as new development was coming, they wanted a basic theme for some of the urban design and things. And so they came up with this idea of the rail district. And part of it is that it's the train lines. And so on the other side of Quebec Street, there is actually a lovely passage that runs between a couple of the new condominium buildings. And it has some rail lines set in the cobblestone. And that is the old Canadian Pacific connection into the False Creek Yards. So they were working on that railway theme. So that gave us a little bit of a thought, but again, it's site and context. And so one of the key things in looking at fire insurance maps was right where our street was supposed to go was all of this railway infrastructure. And if we just call it out, I mean, we had um, the Canadian Pacific line that ran uh, westward along the South Shore Falls Creek, which the historic streetcar used to run on briefly and is still eyed as a transportation corridor that connects into the Arbutus Greenway. And then that arc goes off to uh, the uh, Falls Creek Flats yards. And then it curves upwards and goes across Falls Creek. And that is the Great Northern uh, Railway and that is their line that went across on a trestle and to Chinatown where their train station was from 1905 to 1916 or so. And down at the bottom, we had the engine house for the railroad. And so we had this railway infrastructure and we thought, well, it would be interesting then to play with the railway things and to see what we could pull out of it. And so when we then pull back and look at the, uh, so a larger area, that was also key um, because where the new St. Paul's Hospital is going, that was the site of the Great Northern Station that opened in 1916 and it lasted until the 1960s. There is the Canadian National Station, which is still there. And once COVID disappears, we'll run trains again. 
Uh, and then there's our site where the engine house was for Great Northern uh, as well. So you had some fairly key uh, railway infrastructure, but then you also are close to Hogan's Alley. Now, Hogan's Alley is an interesting space because it has become the center of sort of thinking about the Black community. And it was a, a really important space anyway, because Hogan's Alley, again, is like one of those things that we have pinned at that location under the ramps of the viaduct. But it was also, again, one of those areas that was much larger in sort of actuality. And you can really stretch Hogan's Alley and the idea of it almost to Hastings Street with the nightclubs and through Chinatown, sort of east of Main Street, you had a whole series of chicken joints um, that were scattered through what we think of as Chinatown today. And of course, many of those were after hours places, the vaudeville theaters along Main Street and uh, Hastings Street would close and you'd get your uh, performers that would come down to Hogan's Alley and grab something to eat. Uh, the train stations, well, vaudeville, vaudevillians lived on the trains and the Great Northern was an important vaudeville route because it went through the American Midwest up into Canada and then back down into the States. And so you also had that association with the railway porters. And that was the other key thing was on Main Street at Pryor was the Railway Porters Club. Um, many of us would remember the proximate location is uh, the original Three Vets, Vets store. And then there was the Northern Junk Company and all that sort of stuff. So we were looking at this thinking, well, you've got railway porters, you've got the black community, and you've got the trains. And you've the Pullman Porter or the Pullman Club, um, that starts to think, yes, there's something. And so the other key thing was standing at the foot of Pullman Porter Street, our new street, you could, in theory, see the two strain, train stations here and look across False Creek towards the Roundhouse um, because the uh, porters, uh, the very first contract signed by a black union was with Canadian Pacific in the 1940s uh, for the porters. And so you had all of this connection. And the other thing was just, um, here's a couple of the porters um, outside the club and everything. And Frank Collins, who was a union or organizer and a railway porter, but he was also the president of the BC branch of the Canadian League for the Advancement of Colored People. So we had all of this history and we thought, you know, looking into uh, the Pullman history and what it meant to the black community, um, we thought, yes, let's honor all of this with Pullman Porter Street. And so it was a very, interesting, tense couple of, I think an hour and a half of real deep research and things. But when we put it up there, the committee quite, quite liked it. And it's still one of my favorite uh, names that we've pulled. Um, Frank Collins shows up again because of the Oak Ridge bus garage. Um, here is the site cleared. Um, so you're roughly at Oak Street 41st and um, so it's cleared, it's ready for development. And so when you, and here's the trolley buses that uh, used to run out of the station. And when you lay the developer's map on top of uh, the Oak Ridge site, uh, you can see that it's got this Y type street in there. It's got a huge public park. And uh, so we've got one street that runs from 38th right through to 41st. And then we've got another one that comes in and meets that new street. And so when we were looking at, again, the history of the site, and here's the artist's illustration of how the site will be built out uh, eventually, and it's going to be a fairly dense uh, piece of uh, urbanism. But when we started to look at the site history, uh, we had discovered that there were two women that were quite important as um, one, uh, back in the 30s, held the very first chauffeur's license uh, given to a woman in British Columbia. And she drove a coach between Marpole and uh, Richmond. And uh, so she was a great candidate. 
as well as another woman who was the first uh, driver, woman driver hired by BC Electric after the war and had served as a conductress on the streetcars as well. So they were key candidates. But as we were digging through things, uh, we came back to Frank Collins. And what was interesting was it turns out that he was the first black transit driver in British Columbia. And after being a porter for many, many years, he switched over to becoming a bus driver. And so we thought that would be kind of cool. So this is the long street that runs from 41st to 38th he is going to be Collins Street. And so then we have the other street. Well, we have had uh, some representation from the Jewish Museum and Archives and uh, others on some suggested names, and they've contributed some really great names to our uh, reference list. And of course, the uh, museum and the cultural center and the theater and everything is uh, just across the street, basically, from this site. And so one of the names that was suggested was Nimitz, um, not for a particular person, but in general, the family and the numerous contributions that many members of the Nimitz family have made to uh, Vancouver. And so what we thought was again, location, uh, it made sense then to uh, bring the Nimitz name into this site. So we have Collins Street and we have Nimitz Drive. And uh, so those are, will be two of the new uh, street names showing up in the city at some point. One of the ones that was really a lot of fun to work on was the West End Lanes. And one of the curiosities about the West End and the survey history is the lanes themselves are 30, if not 33 feet wide. And that means they're a street. Yeah, a lane is typically 20 feet wide. And uh, so it's not seen as a traffic carry, like a major traffic carrying entity. Whereas a 30 foot wide um, uh, thing is a street. And one of the things that the uh, new West End plan that was worked on starting all the way back in 2013 and finally published and passed by council in 2016 was to look at densification and infill within the West End. And so one of the uh, suggestions was to look at property where you had something that was existing and you had say a garage in this illustration, well, why not take down the garage and put up a small infill, say a four unit or five unit townhouse. And you could access it off the lane because it was a road. And then that way you could address it. So that way you had a secondary street system. And if you looked at another example, for instance, you might have an existing apartment building that has a large parking lot out the back. Well, why not fill that with some townhouse development as well? And if you made it rental and family orientated, uh, then kills a couple of birds with one stone. And so again, if you are going to have an address, well, then you need a street name. And so one of the projects that we had for a number of years was to give names to the lanes in the West End. And it was an opportunity to really bring diversity to the streetscape. Uh, it was a really interesting exercise. We wanted to bring in as many women as we possibly could. And there were some really amazing women that were, we were able to honor. But at the same time, you know, with the gay community and the AIDS um, epidemic that swept through there. There are some key players there, so we've honored some of those. And so uh, Vivian Jung is Jung Lane, and that sits between Harwood and Beach Avenue. And uh, she was actually a teacher, and uh, she's the one that broke the color bar for uh, swimming pools. Uh, way back, you had to actually have, if you were a teacher, uh, you had to have your swimming certificate, your lifeguard certificate. And uh, Vivian went with her classmates to uh, the Crystal Pool and was told, no, you can't come in. Um, you know, Chinese don't swim with everyone else. And uh, her classmates said, well, nuts to that. And they all left. And that action set in motion the uh, eventual taking away of that 
uh, bar. And so we chose the lane at Harwood and Beach because it's close as we could get to the location of the crystal pool. Um, Maxine McGilvery is someone else who really gets short shrift in Vancouver history. Um, you know, and we named it Maxine Lane. Now we like to use both names for women, but occasionally there's conflict with street names elsewhere in the lower mainland. Everything the committee does has to go through emergency services. Um, you know, they have to vet it. Can it be pronounced? Does it duplicate anything? Um, you know, so they have a set of criteria that have to be met. So Maxine Lane is what we um, have named between Davy and Burnaby, because that's about as close as we can get to Maxine's beauty school, and uh, which sits on Bidwell. And Maxine McGilvery was actually an incredible businesswoman. She had her um, degrees in chemistry. She uh, came up to Canada and opened up essentially a, a beauty salon in the Spencer's department store. She taught people, women, how to do makeup, uh, opened a small factory in the East End, actually near Strathcona to produce her own cosmetics, um, married uh, Ivor Bebb and uh, accompanied to great lengths. And she had a string of beauty salons, opened up the beauty school in the West End, and then got into hotels as well later in life. And unfortunately for her, her name, Maxine, seems to attract all sorts of salacious sort of rumors. And none of it, absolutely none of it is true. And so by putting Maxine Lane um, down, um, we were able to bring her back and I think give her some credence. And it's just a pleasure to, I think, to have her name on a street. Um, Ted North, and one of the great things we had the sign department make sure that they put everything lowercase because Ted always signed everything in lowercase. And uh, Ted North Lane uh, between Pendrel and uh, Davy, And uh, they were just a really strong advocate for uh, AIDS and uh, other things. And we really wanted to honor uh, someone like that. So that's Ted. And then Rosemary Brown, um, because again, she had associations with the West End and all of the folks that we uh, pulled the names for had an association with the West End. And uh, Rosemary Brown, we felt that even though she has this tiny, tiny little park over just off Vine Street in the brewery district there, uh, we felt that that wasn't really sufficient. And so we felt that a lane uh, in the West End would be pretty good and a nice long one too. So it's the one that runs between Robson and Harrow and it runs the length of the neighborhood. And so these are just some of the key people. And then uh, we also put Jepson Young uh, Lane and that's uh, between Pendrel and Comox and that runs right behind the Dr. Peter Center named for him. And uh, in our fantasy, someone would be hailing a taxi or say by phone, and they would phone and they'd say, I'm at the Dr. Peter Center, and I'll meet you on Jepson Young Lane. And then that way we get his full name out there in the, in the landscape. Uh, the Pantages Lane, uh, that's between Davy and Burnaby, and that's for Peter Pantages, uh, Polar Bear Swim, and uh, where this comes out at the end near the beach is roughly at the site where the original Polar Bear Swim took place. And uh, Ihu, uh, a native Hawaiian who was at the Kanaka Ranch, uh, which was down in Cole Harbor at the foot of uh, Denman Street, roughly, an informal settlement. Um, but uh, Ihu was also married to um, Simia, and we've named a lame after her, and she's a direct descendant of uh, Capilano. And so we have um, a couple of uh, indigenous names there, Stovolt uh, for K. Stovolt, uh, an amazing community organizer and founder of the West End Community Center, uh, West End Seniors Community Center, and Simia. Uh, she uh, was married to Ihu and is related to Capilano. And Henshaw for Julia Henshaw, once Canada's most popular novelist, 
a great explorer and all sorts of things. And so really great and lived in the West End again. So we were able to bring all these very diverse names uh, to the street. And it, it was a lot of fun to come up with the names as well. And I'll show you one other thing later um, about street signs, which has had a really great impact as well. Uh, one of our other favorites is uh, this name, Lob, uh, Lob Avenue. Uh, this is the Art Shopping Mall prior to redevelopment uh, from the 1970s, I think, or early 80s. And it, as the developer said and others, it was functionally at the end of its life. And so it's being redeveloped. And so this is the conceptual scheme. And uh, the Safeway store is already open. Um, in the new building. But one of the key things for this site was that um, one street that's going through was just an extension of U Street. So if your street lines up with another street, there's no point in trying to create another name, plus emergency services hates that. So um, this is an extension of U. But the city also had a right of way through the site and that right of way comes out to Arbutus. And so one of the things that we were looking at was, well, what's the history here? Can we do something with Arbutus? And so we looked at a number of different things. Um, we went and looked at uh, the Greek history in the neighborhood, of course, because you have St. George's, that extraordinary mid-century church uh, nearby. Uh, we looked at a couple of other uh, groups and things. We kept Arbutus tree in the back of our minds because we really wanted to see what we could do with Arbutus trees. Uh, but then we got into logging because the Arbutus Mall sits on Arbutus. But when you go out the back and through the townhouses, you get dropped down into this low line area, which has Valley Drive running through it, which is an old skid road and actually an old route, railway right of way for the first steam logging railroad in British Columbia. And so when we started looking at the history of the logging, this was Jerry Rogers who was logging this area off. And his logging crews always had a um, whole mixture of different uh, men working on it. And one of the things that his crews always had were indigenous men. So then we were thinking, well, if you've got an indigenous group, you're gonna have men from different nations. So how are they talking amongst themselves and how are they talking to the guys on the crew? Well, the working language and trade language was Chinook. And one of our favorite books that sits um, at the committee, uh, one of our members, Melly Bain, always has a copy of it. Um, and we thought, well, let's pull out the book and see what there is. What is the Chinook word for Arbutus tree? And lo and behold, L-A-H-B, lob, and it is the Arbutus and the leaf. I didn't know this about how you used to smoke it alone or mixed with tobacco. I've never tried that. Anyway, what we did was we came up with Lob, and so it becomes Lob Avenue. And the nice little joke is, of course, you have Lob Avenue and Arbutus Street. So it's Arbutus and Arbutus meet each other. And so um, that's where we came up with that one. And the River District is interesting, too, because this was the white pine, a Canadian white pine sawmill. And um, the mill was one of the largest uh, mills uh, going. This is a, a shot looking west across the lumber yard down the Fraser River. And uh, so it was in business in one sense or another between 1910 and 2001. And then um, it's purchased by Weyerhaeuser. They bought a whole number of mills and then eventually shut uh, the vast majority of them down. And this is what happened here. White Pine was, was shut down. And so the site then went up for development. A very long, um, very long and very comprehensive public process uh, developed the underlying plan for it. And of course you're on the river. Oh, I forgot to say that the mill was an immense uh, 200,000 board feet of lumber per day. That is equivalent of 38 miles of lumber end on end that came out of the mill per day. So it was a massive entity. The uh, river district then as it formed, and this is the conceptual plan that was um, 
worked on, um, you know, was identified as the river district. It made sense. When they took the sawmill wharfs away, they actually found much of the natural shoreline was still there. And uh, there was a lot of remediation as well, but they were very surprised um, doing the analysis of the shoreline to see how much it still supported fish and bird life and, and the reed beds and various things like that. So the naming structure down here started off with one developer, the original one, and their naming criteria was basically, if you put river in front of it, it was fine. So that was it. And so, you know, when they came to the early committee, um, oh, we need a name. And the committee was thinking, oh, let's think about, and they'd go, well, we were thinking we want river walk. Oh, well, how about, nope. And so, you know, you got river district crossing, you got river walk, you got river this, etc. cetera. Uh, just above the uh, bubble with the developer's naming criteria, there's that curved street up there. And that's a set of um, townhouses, which um, low rise townhouses in the city worked with the developer to develop a songbird strategy for the entire site, but it was piloted up there. And so with a burst of imagination, the curved street was known as Songbird, Terra, uh, Songbird Crescent, I think. Um, anyway, new developer, developer took over. Uh, Sawmill Crescent was one of the new streets and that uh, comes off of uh, Marine and swoops through the site. So it's one of the longest uh, streets there. And Sawmill Crescent sounds kind of cool. And then the new, and there's River District Crossing and Sawmill Crescent. And the new developer was open to new ideas. And uh, that was the fun part because, uh, you know, we were thinking, oh boy, they're gonna come with their boring list again. And uh, nope. So we were able to propose um, Bull Rush Road. Um, bull rushes were an important uh, fiber for indigenous, uh, certainly here on the river and elsewhere. And uh, the reeds, are used for weaving baskets and things for cooking and other things. So bulrush, Ulican Way, it's one of our favorites. Um, Ulican, known as candlefish, was important for its oil, but it's an incredibly important food source. Um, and so we have that. And Rivergrass Drive, and you're thinking, well, he just said he didn't like river in front of names, but Rivergrass, well, Musqueam, loosely translates as people of the river, people of the river grass. And the grasses themselves are part of um, the origin story, as well as an important resource from the river for again, weaving and cooking baskets and various things like that. And what we were doing here was trying to bring at least an acknowledgement of an indigenous use and practice without using indigenous names because we have to get permission to use those names. And the protocol between City Hall and the um, host nations, uh, it's not a well-developed protocol for people like us going, hey, we'd like to name a street. Um, so there's a long process going on at the city right now of developing the protocols and, and things like that. But this was our way of acknowledging and bringing some of the indigenous um, use and things into the site. But one of the things we we're very happy with was Jack Opal Street. And this really showed, I think, the uh, new developer sort of sense that yes, things could change, things could be um, different. And so Jack Opal was um, a sawmill owner himself, but he was a huge member of the South Asian community and on many, many accomplishments. But one of the key things, again, looking at the site and wanting to be connected to the site, um, you know, Jack had a sawmill a little bit further west, but one of the key things that we found from reading some of the memoirs of sawmill workers was that many of these guys couldn't open a bank account, for instance. And so what, it, what happened to their paycheck? Well, Jack was the one that cashed it. And so basically he became sort of the banking service to many of the men. Um, he offered uh, great support, um, many different initiatives and things. 
And so because of that connection to the site, we thought that uh, Jack Opal Street um, would be a perfect um, addition to the River District. And it was the first South Asian name on a street in Vancouver ever. And so that was very important as well. And it became a big deal too, because uh, city council held a special ceremony. So this sign is purely ceremonial uh, for family members. Uh, the former attorney general, um, Wally Opal showed up to speak and various other things. It was quite the day at city council. And, you know, when you go down to the um, site right now, it's still under construction. Uh, eventually there will be buildings on either side of Jack Opal Street and uh, the street will get longer. We're extending it as the next phase uh, to the south opens up. We're going to extend Jack Opal Street a little bit longer. So it'll be a fairly decent street down in the River District. And then um, some names, you know, you, you, we ponder, 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 ponder. We play with all sorts of things, thinking that we've hit it right. And then it just sinks at the next meeting or sinks a year later. And so the Oak Ridge development here um, and the massive redevelopment uh, requires only two street names. One is a public right of way that we haven't named yet. And the other one is the road that sits at the back of the site that's now formalized as a real road um, and they needed a name. So one of the things that's interesting when you talk to many of my Chinese Canadian friends, um, you know, my, my friend Bob Sung keeps talking about this area as Chinese Shaughnessy. Um, as folks moved out of Chinatown or Strathcona, uh, they tended to buy uh, along Canby, Oak, um, and through the area. And um, so it was, it was quite a desired neighborhood. And we were thinking about Chinese Canadian history on the site, modern Chinese Canadian history as well. We played around with a couple of different names. One of them that floated to the top that yeah, we thought might work uh, was Gold Mountain, for instance. And, um, you know, using the, uh, the Chinese for it, Gom Song, um, we thought might work. And we road tested that with uh, folks out at UBC and elsewhere. And it was sort of receiving a, yeah, that's okay type of thing. Uh, we also looked at the Jewish community. Um, we had uh, Otto Landauer, a photographer of uh, mid-century Vancouver. And, uh, you know, he, he photographed the Oak Ridge area a lot. And we thought that might fit. We had second thoughts as we were pondering. And so then we did um, more research and just thought, what are we going to do? So here's the uh, official city plan laid on top of the Oak Ridge drawing. And so we have that street at the back. So we went and looked at the area and looked at the history of the Southern Slope. And one of the key things was Chinese market gardens. And, you know, here we have one of the large uh, market gardens on the Southern Slope, uh, just above Southwest Marine at the foot of, oh, let's see. I'll call it the foot of um, Fraser for the sake of argument. But the southern slope was market gardens. And they provided up to 60% fresh uh, produce available in uh, Vancouver stores. And Chinatown and Mount Pleasant were an important center for uh, the market gardeners to distribute their produce. And so we were looking at that idea of the market gardens. And that's where Choi Yun comes in. It means market garden. And so we went back out to UBC, Professor Henry Yu uh, and uh, his students, and we had input from elsewhere. And Choi Yoon was the one that really worked. And what's really nice is it's a curved street, so we get to call it a crescent, so Choi Yoon Crescent. And so it's a way of, again, acknowledging an aspect of Chinese Canadian history that we tend to overlook these days. Um, but it imp was an important part of Vancouver history and food history. So that's going to be the new street um, at Oak Ridge. And it certainly doesn't fit some of the bright and glossy um, sort of ideas of Oak Ridge, but I think it's important to learn stuff that sometimes might be slightly awkward. 
And so this is Choi Yoon Street that's going to run right round the side of the Oak Ridge development. And so um, we're looking forward to seeing that street sign up. So I wanted to show you this because one of the things that we've come to recognize in names is that when you throw a name up, what does it mean? You know, if, if you asked anybody, you know, where a street name came from or any name on a building or something, it's like, hmm, I don't know. And sometimes buildings have a plaque somewhere tucked in a closet that tell you about the person. But we came up with um, a problem in the West End because we wanted to name the street after Vivian Jung. But emergency services says we couldn't use Vivian. There are too many Vivians in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland as streets. And as a matter of just seconds of an operator trying to find Vivian Jung, you know, lane as you're busy having your heart attack, they said, no, you can't use Vivian. So we came up with Jung Lane, but when it went to council, uh, Carrie Jang said, um, which Jung? And we went, well, Vivian Jung. Well, how do I know that? It could be Douglas Jung. It could be this Jung. I know many Jungs. And we were faced with losing Vivian Jung's name because of that. And what the committee did was come back with the idea of putting the tagline so that you could actually see Vivian Jung, barrier breaking teacher, Dr. Peter Jepson Young, AIDS activist, educator. And all of the street signs in the West End have that descriptor. And what's fascinating is to be in the West End and walking around and watching people walk up and read the signs and then go, oh, oh, he's that guy that was on TV. I remember that. Or in Leah Henshaw, um, I can't remember the exact descriptor we wrote, but I've watched people look at that and go, oh, really? And then get on their phone and they want to find out her books or paintings or whatever. And so it becomes a way of information that then allows us to, um, and when we extend um, Jack Opal, we will have a tagline for him. And what we're working towards is having this become the standard for street signs. So that when a new sign goes up, a new name, or someone drives over an old one, uh, you can then replace the sign and put the descriptor on. And it's just a way of informing folks a little bit more about the names that are in the environment. And it's something that the committee really is pleased with. Um, council accepted it, the sign folks like it because we didn't muck up their signs, you know, cause any trouble with it. And so now as part of the work of the committee is that we actually then come up with the name and then somebody or a couple have to come up with the tagline as well so that that goes forward. And this way then I think we'll create an environment within the city that will have a heck of a lot more education in it just because you'll get a sense of who the person was and maybe want to go learn a bit more. And so that's one thing that we're really happy with. Which then brings us back to this guy, right? Because he's the sort of stink in the room that everyone pointed to. And, you know, at one point, um, Trutch got the stickers up there and things like that. Now, as I said, the provincial government named um, the street. We didn't. And the city didn't. But he does stand out because he is one where you can point to his actions in terms of reducing the uh, reserves that were set aside for the indigenous population to almost unusable proportions. Uh, it was McBride and his committee that then finished the work by even reducing them further to very unsustainable pieces of ground. Um, but Trutch is one of many folks that are troublesome. And I think most dead white guys of that era are probably troublesome. A private project I have is I do a lot of research and as I'm working away on you know, different buildings or different projects, if I come across anyone who's associated with uh, the Anti-Asiatic League, for instance, or the Exclusion League, I put them in my book. Um, I have many pages now of people who were members of that, those organizations. And I keep that list just so that we never name anything after those folks. Um, so 
The city has a renaming policy. Um, it's not great. It wasn't well thought out. It was a, and I'm telling tales out of school, but it was a very quick, a half-assed gesture um, that council created. But again, it puts the onus on the public. So if you want to get rid of trudge, you have to get 75% of the owners that live on the street to sign a petition that says we want to get rid of trudge. But then that petition comes to the Civic Assets Naming Committee where we go, yeah, let's get rid of them or not. But there's no requirement from our recommendation to city council to get rid of the trudge name. And part of the problem is that the integrated society we have of databases and infrastructure and everything else, removing a street name in this day and age is a very expensive, complicated process. Now that's not to justify keeping names, but it does make it slightly difficult. So one of the things that we're hopefully working towards is a much broader, better policy that allows for things to change. Um, and that's all wrapped up in a commemorative naming policy that's slowly working its way through the city bureaucracy. But the one thing though, is that with our taglines, I think it would be a really interesting challenge, but I think it would be fun to do. Come up with the tagline that describes exactly what Mr. Trutch was and put it on the street sign and then put that as every sign broke. You know, if you drive over them, they have to be replaced. Um, and then you could actually put history back on the street and put Trutch in his place. So there are some possibilities of that. And there are other commemorative opportunities and meaning commemorative in, informational wise that maybe there's something that you tag onto the street sign that actually has a fuller text that describes who he is and what he did. And so there are options, not just to remove a name, but it is a problem still. It's something the committee is very aware of. And it's something that, um, you know, we're seeking a resolution to. Um, and, you know, and Trutch is the poster boy for racism and uh, is that lightning rod. So at some point we'll figure out what to do with him. But I do want to leave you with the much promised sewage pumping station because you know the civic assets naming committee names city assets well that includes all manner of things and one of the requests was from the city surveyor we're building a sewage pumping station in the river district and they want a name well the thing in the white in the river district was that they actually had never commemorated the white pine mill itself they had Sawmill Crescent. They had, I think, a street that incorporated mill in it, but the White Pine Mill name didn't show up. So we decided to name the sewage pumping station. And here is that very elegant sewage pumping station with its name. And so um, that's kind of naming and how we get up to it and some of the thought processes that goes into it. Um, it's not something that we take lightly. It's something that I think, as I look back through the research that I do on things, I'm always intrigued with names. Names have meaning. And I think it behooves us to take the care, the time to create meaningful names um, that are in place, that have a context and a meaning for where they're placed, instead of just throwing something anywhere on the environment. And so I'll end with the uh, pumping station. So there you go.